A Treatise of Satan's Temptations By Richard Gilpin A Discourse of the Malice, Power, Cruelty and Diligence of Satan Fourth Part of Chapter 16 Of Satan's Third Grand Policy for Maintaining His Possession, Which is His Feigned Departure The fourth and last stratagem of Satan for the keeping his possession, is to stop the way, to barricade up all passages, that there may be no possibility of escape or retreat. When he perceives that his former ways of policy are not sufficient, but that his slaves and servants are so far enlightened, in the discovery of a danger, that they are ready to turn back from him, then he bestirs himself to oppose their revolt. And as God sometimes hedgeth up the way of sinners with thorns, that they should not follow their old lovers, so doth Satan. Hosea 2 6. To which purpose? 1. First, he endeavors to turn them off such resolutions, by threatening to reduce them with a strong hand. Here he boasts and vaunts of his power and sinner's weakness. As Rabshakeh did against Hezekiah, what is that confidence wherein thou trustest? Have the gods of Hamath and Arpad, delivered their land out of my hand? 2 Kings 18:33, 34. Have those that have gone before you been able to deliver themselves from me? Have they been able to rescue themselves? Did I not force those that were stronger than you? Did I not make David number the people? Did I not overcome him in the matter of Uriah? Did I not compel Peter to deny his Lord, notwithstanding his solemn profession to the contrary? And can you think to break away from me so easily? By this means he would weaken their heart, and enfeeble their resolutions, that they might sit down under their bondage, as hopeless ever to recover themselves. From his snare, but if these affrightments hinder not, if, notwithstanding these brags, sinners prepare themselves, to turn from sin to God, then. 2. Secondly, he improves all he can that distance which sin, hath made betwixt God and them. Sins of ordinary infirmity and common incursion, do not so break the peace of God's children, as sins of a higher nature do. Even in the saints themselves, we may observe, after notorious transgression, 1, that the acquaintance and familiarity betwixt God and them is immediately broken. What a speedy alteration is made! How suddenly are all things changed! God hides himself. The sun that shined but now, and did afford a very comfortable and cherishing heat, before we are aware, is now hid in a cloud. Our warmth and refreshments are turned into cold and chillness. There is also a change on our part, and that suddenly. As in the resurrection, we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. So here, in a moment, our joys flag and decay, our delights grow dull, our activity is impaired, we are bound and frozen up. And it is altogether winter with the soul. 2. It may be noted, that this begets an estrangement in us, and we so carry it as if we had resolved, not to renew our league with God. For though we are not altogether so desperate, as to make formal resolutions of continuing in sin, of casting off God, and bidding an everlasting farewell, to our former acquaintance, though we do not say, we will now undo ourselves quite, and harden ourselves in our rebellion, yet sin hath left us in such a maze, and filled us with so many dams, and misgiving thoughts, that we do not think of returning. We are at a stand, and like a mighty man astonished, that cannot find his hands. We perceive we have lost so much, and have run into such great unkindnesses, that, like broken merchants, nothing is more irksome and tedious, than to review our ways. Or look into our debt books. Instead of this, we endeavor to divert our thoughts, to cast off care, as if we conceived that time would eat it out. And that then of course we might fall into the old channel of freedom and comfort. 3. When we return at last, oh, with what bashfulness and amazedness, do we appear at our next supplications? What blushing, what damps, what apology? Nay, sometimes as the man without the wedding garment, we are speechless. Matthew 22:12. How rightly doth such a man resemble the publican confessing, and the prodigal supplicating? While consulting what to say for himself, he now begins to feel with what sense and feeling, the prophets and holy men of old used to express themselves. In their confessions, we blush, we are ashamed, astonished, and confounded. This distance sin makes, betwixt saints and God sometimes. But betwixt God and the unconverted, it is far greater. Now, when either an unconverted sinner or a fallen saint, puts himself to look to God for reconciliation, then doth the devil labor to improve this, for their hindrance. That he accuseth us to God, is evident by Satan standing at Joshua's right hand, Zechariah 3 1. How he accuseth God to us we know. He tells us it is in vain to seek to make up our peace, after so great provocations. Urging that he is a jealous God, 
of pure eyes, highly resenting the affronts we have given him, etc. Nay, he goes so high this way, that God is put to it in Scripture, of purpose to furnish us with an answer to these objections. To proclaim that he is slow to anger, not easily provoked. That if men return from the evil of their ways, he will return to them, accept, and pity them, etc. 3. Thirdly, if this divert them not, but that they still persist in their resolves, then he follows after them with a high hand. Sometimes, as Pharaoh did with Israel, he grows severe and imperious with them, and redoubles the tale of their bricks. He forceth them to higher and more frequent iniquities. Sometimes, as the same Pharaoh, he musters up all his chariots and horsemen to pursue after them, and in the highest diligence imaginable. He brings forth his greatest power, besetting them on all sides, with temptations and allurements of pleasures and delight. Where he perceives his time to be short, and his power shaken, he comes down and resolves to try his utmost strength. And hence it is that converts complain, that when they begin in earnest to look after God, they are most troubled with temptations. Besides this, whatever he can do to make them drive heavily, Exodus 14:25, shall not be wanting. Sometimes he makes attempts upon their thoughts and affections, which are as their chariot wheels. And if these can be knocked off any way, it retards them. Sometimes he casts stumbling blocks in their way. If any prejudice may divert them, if threatenings or penalties can hinder, if the frownings of friends, or anything else can put a stop to their proceedings, he will have them ready. Sometimes he endeavors to retard them by solicitations of acquaintance, offers of former occasions and opportunities of sinning, or whatever else may be as a remora to their intentions. 4. Fourthly, but if none of these serve, then, as his last shift, he proclaims open war against them, pursues them as enemies and rebels. Now he begins to accuse them for that which they did, by his advice and temptation. Now sins that were called little are aggravated. Now that day of repentance, which he was wont to say was long, he tells them it is quite spent, that the sun of their hope is set. Nothing now doth he suggest but hell, damnation, and wrath. He makes them, as it were, see it, hear it, and feel it in everything. That interest in their hearts which he dissembled before, now he stands upon and asserts, and will not be beat off. Designing in all this either to make them weary of these new resolves, by this unusual disquietment and hostility. Or to precipitate them upon some desperate undertaking, or at least to avenge himself upon them, inventing his malice and rage against them. But of this more afterward. Thanks.